will begin recording now and welcome you all this evening to um, spend a little while with Eric Amaro from the Waterville Valley Recreation Department, though he's much more than just Eric Amaro from the Waterville Valley Recreation yeah. Department. Oh, that's, that's plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it's again, one of those things, you know, you look at the resume, okay, he's done a few things besides work for the rec department, but that's what he's doing for uh, the, the time being in Waterville Valley. And um, tonight I will um, turn over your topic to you, but we're glad to um, <laughs> think about winter, <laughs> even if it's kind of a, a, you know, low snow year, doesn't mean it's not winter though out there. So. Yeah, well, I mean, I just took a bunch of the, the, the kids from the school here on a snowshoe hike after they got out of school, which is, uh, you know, kind of like sheep herding cats, um, you know, a snowshoe falls off every here now and then and they want to roll in the snow and, you know, it's all, all good fun, but there is some snow out there, you know, there's, it was really good snowshoeing today and I, I think I'm definitely bringing my cross country skis tomorrow, um, okay. see if I can play around a little bit, but uh yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I was a last minute stand in for George Clooney. I think he was supposed to was, was he I think he was supposed to talk tonight. But <laughs> unfortunately, you get the, the JV team tonight. So um, but I thought, uh, you know, talk a little bit about um, just kind of safety in the outdoors, um, just kind of, um, you know, snowshoeing, hiking, uh, whatever you're doing out there in the outdoors uh, during the wintertime, some of um, some of the challenges uh, and then some of the things that, um, you know, I'd suggest considering and, and bringing with you. Um, definitely hope to get a lot of participation and questions, comments, their own people's own stories or suggestions. Otherwise, you're just going to hear me droning on and on and on all night. So we don't want that. So definitely unmute and feel free to, um, to ask questions or, or make comments or, or share suggestions. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, should I just get into this or do a little bit about myself or what, what do you think, Leah? <laughs> well, you know, it's a group of uh, a few of us know you, but, you know, I don't know that much. So I'd, I'd love to hear a touch more about your background um, and your interest, how you got to the Valley and then definitely get get on yeah. into it. Yeah. Um, so I grew up not too far from here. Uh, I grew up in Center Harbor and Meredith. I uh, went to Interlakes High School and was fortunate enough to have a uh, a number of friends whose families were really into the outdoors. Um, I was definitely the black sheep in my family. Like my family, you know, would do a little bit of hiking here and there, but we, we weren't like a skiing family. Um, and, you know, you know, living in this area, living in the lakes region, you know, it's a great place to grow up because there's so many rivers, so many lakes. And my big thing was canoeing and hiking. And um, so it definitely came up here quite a bit. Um, and then um, after high school, um, you know, after working for a little while, uh, I decided uh, to hike the Appalachian Trail. Um, so it was when I was 18, turning 19, and I did the Appalachian Trail from, from, um, from Georgia to Maine. Um, and while on that hike, I ran into uh, a bunch of really interesting people to say the least, <laughs> there's definitely some characters that are on that trail year to year, but um, I ran into a number of Outward Bound programs and uh, got to talk to some of the instructors. And, um, and it really kind of sparked my interest because I, I love the outdoors. I was working construction. I worked, um, you know, uh, for the Squam Lake Science Center. So I really liked the outdoors. I just didn't really have much focus on like where to go. And so, you know, having you know, five and a half months of living outdoors, meeting other, you know, outdoor professionals. It was just a really um, kind of eye-opening experience. And uh, so I started looking into schools and I settled on Northern College in Asheville, Wisconsin, which is right there in Shawamigan Bay, right on Lake Superior. And uh, one of the defining uh, kind of def uh, factors for me on choosing that school was um, one, it was right on Lake Superior and just amazing kayaking. And then just uh, not too many hours away from the Boundary Waters Canoe Wilderness. Um, so, you know, my big passion is canoeing and kayaking, just the right place for it. And, um, you know, my wife still jokes that like, you know, I, I spent all my time doing dog sledding and skiing and snowshoeing and hiking, and that was my school. <laughs> um, and uh, 
I loved it. And so after that, um, I worked as a kayak guide on Lake Superior. I worked uh, for the Forest Service as a backcountry ranger in the Boundary Waters uh, Canoe Wilderness. <clears throat> worked on wildland firefighter um, and uh, guiding in, uh, on Lake Superior. And then uh, after working in the Boundary Waters for a little while, started working for Outward Bound um, and then did that uh, in Minnesota, Florida, Coast of Maine. And uh, that, that, that was a big chunk of kind of post-college work. Um, and uh, yeah, and worked as a main guide. Um, and now uh, before this position, I worked professionally um, as a domestic engineer, uh, which is basically a, a very fancy term for a stay-at-home dad. So about five years, uh, four years, I was raising my two boys at home and um, definitely uh, <laughs> went by way too fast. I absolutely loved it. Um, I used to have really long hair, but I think the stress kind of knocked out my hair quite a bit, but uh, no, it was, it was amazing. Um, and I think working as a professional guide definitely got me well prepared uh, for being a father uh, because of just, you know, um, being always, you know, situationally aware and safety factors and being prepared for things. So I think it, it uh, prepared me pretty well. Although my wife likes to joke um, that it didn't prepare, prepare me too well because me being super safe dad, uh, both the boys broke their arm and a leg on my watch. Uh, so she doesn't let me forget that, but um, fortunately they bounce and heal pretty quick. So anyway, uh, that's in a nutshell me, uh, but my whole life is just working in the outdoors and um, just uh, really, really enjoy it. And one of my favorites is, you know, working in the outdoors in the wintertime. Um, you know, I am very, very blessed to work in the boundary waters during the wilderness, uh, boundary waters wilderness in the, the wintertime. And uh, one of my favorite memories of, you know, winter camping um, was uh, seeing a group of wolves crossing from one lake to another. We were camped on that lake and the Northern Lights came out like, you know, like a movie. It was just absolutely incredible. Um, and we listened to the wolves all night long. It was just incredible. Um, so uh, I definitely love the outdoors. Uh, the winter is definitely one of those special times for, for sure. So, um, but again, please interrupt with questions or comments as we go. I'll just keep rambling. So probably need Leah to kind of keep me on task here. But um, so let's get into it. Um, you know, some of the, like I was saying, the great pleasures of being outdoors in the wintertime is, uh, you know, the solitude. I find it just absolutely amazing that, you know, I can go on a hike um, in, you know, like Scar Ridge or something like that <clears throat> and uh, do it a bunch of times throughout the year, but in the wintertime it's different. You know, it's, it's quiet. Most of the songbirds have migrated. Um, the insects are gone. Um, you know, it just, it's like the woods is holding its breath a little bit and, uh, you know, just something magical about that time. Um, with that though, uh, there's a few considerations uh, that uh, I think is very important when we go out there. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, winter weather, um, heat loss and production, uh, a little bit about food and water and why that's so important, uh, equipment, uh, your layering system, Safety equipment, um, basically considerations and a few tips and tricks. Um, and again, uh, you know, feel free at any point to, to jump in and uh, ask questions or, or uh, add in to, to, with your comments. So just kind of an overview of what I'm planning to talk about. Um, so you've been forewarned. Um, so you can get up and get some popcorn or go turn the TV on somewhere else if you're not interested. I'm not gonna be uh, offended by, by that at all. So, um, so Mount Washington, uh, as you know, is uh, home to some of the worst weather in the world. And uh, it's not, shouldn't really be too surprising if you look into it, why uh, there's a number of, of teams and, and individual climbers that train uh, Mount Washington to hike K2 or climb Everest. So 
Um, it really does have some incredible challenges if you're going to be out there in in that winter weather, that uh, Arctic weather <clears throat> can happen at any time of the year. Um, so there's a number of factors, um, largely our prevailing wind patterns and especially wind is is funneled. Um, so Mount Washington is one of those those points where a lot of that weather and wind is funneled and forced. Um, and there's really not a lot breaking it up. There's not a lot to um, our west and northwest uh, that's going to break up a lot of that. Um, and then the southern Appalach Appalachians, um, you know, fronts can just follow that along and move right up into Washington. So uh, if you have not gone um, to the Mount Washington Observatory, um, or if you haven't had a chance to go on to their website, they've got a phenomenal app um, on your phone. Like I actually I can look it up right now but I use this a lot before I go out if I'm hiking in the presidentials um, and I just you know every time there's a, a storm coming um, or just uh, you know just to see what's going on in Mount Washington but whoops I got the wrong one so it's mountwashington.org and right now it's 6,288 feet it is 14 degrees uh, about 35 miles per hour. Just a, a ton of great information on this website. Um, so it's very fascinating. Um, not only the weather, but the flora and fauna up there because you are literally in the Arctic um, when you get above that tree line. Um, so some of, uh, some of the things that we should probably talk about, <clears throat> uh, certainly the benefits of the outdoors less people, less bugs, uh, just a, a different experience. Um, and uh, some of those, those challenges certainly are temperatures. Uh, you know, our bodies are not really well adapted uh, for retaining heat. We're, we're more better adapted um, physically of getting rid of heat. So we're more of a, a warm weather species, if you will. Um, so the temperatures can always be a challenge. Um, I remember a number of years ago going up to uh, Jay Peak and uh, one of the top chair lifts, you know, that wind was coming down uh, hard from the Canadian border. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to get cold out there real fast. Uh, so temperatures, snow depth, uh, it'd be nice if we could worry a little bit more right now about the snow depth. Uh, but certainly uh, when you're on a trail, hiking, snowshoeing, skiing, uh, if you're breaking trail, that can um, <clears throat> add a lot of time to, uh, to your trip that day. So uh, and it could also be really taxing on your body, uh, breaking trail. Uh, so snow depth, it can also um, make some real interesting challenges in navigation, uh, trying to find the trail. You know, trees can get loaded with snow, branches can cover trail signs. Um, you know, it, trail signs can get completely blown over or covered with snow. So snow depth can also um, add some some real interesting challenges. Ice and road conditions. Uh, so obviously, you know, ice can be a really difficult thing to, to deal with, um, both in just hiking up or down a trail, but also, uh, you know, especially if you're above tree line, you get that freezing rain or ice buildup. Uh, there's also, I think I've got a slide here of Adams, um, in the springtime in April, where uh, that ice is so thin, your crampons don't do anything because it just breaks through and then your, your crampons are just sliding around on the rock. Um, so ice, and then also just the road conditions um, can make it really challenging or, or, or dangerous. Uh, statistically, in any outdoor uh, program, you're statistically, uh, the most dangerous thing you're gonna do is the drive. So. It's not the hike, it's not the rafting trip, it's, it's not the sea kayaking, it's actually just being on a highway driving to that activity um, is statistically is the most dangerous thing. Um, so being aware of, of road conditions, uh, wind and visibility. So wind uh, can be a really difficult thing to, to deal with. And we certainly get a lot of it up here in the mountains, especially in the presidentials. Um, and uh, 
that is one of the, the fastest ways that your body is going to lose heat. So uh, wind can really rob you of your energy and your heat. It can also make it really difficult to move in if it's, you know, you're getting 40, 50 knots. Uh, that's really difficult to move in. Um, and then it can be really hard to look into that if it's a headwind. So wind can be a real challenge. Uh, visibility from wind, you know, sometimes we get fog even in the wintertime, um, but driving snow can make it difficult, make uh, route finding and navigation difficult. Stream crossings, uh, this one always surprises people uh, in the wintertime. So we'll take folks out on snowshoe hikes um, or even just, you know, going out with some friends and they're always surprised that there's running water. Yeah, we've got a lot of stream crossings here in the Whites. Uh, a lot of those streams don't completely freeze up. So that can be a challenge as well. And then lack of, of sunlight just from, you know, this time of year, although we're slowly getting a little bit of sunlight back um, since the solstice, uh, but you gotta be considerate, uh, and, uh, consider the amount of light that you have in your hike and be aware of your pace so that you know how much daylight you should have left. Uh, and then also mountain shadow. So when you have that sun going behind that ridge line, behind that, um, that summit, it gets fa darker faster and it can also um, create a shadow that, uh, that kind of covers where you're hiking. Uh, and, and so you're kind of losing light even faster. So, all right. So those are the challenges. Um, as I was saying, the wind is one of those big ones that's real difficult. And I would just say, you know, if you're not familiar with uh, wind chill, be aware of it. Um, it is, you can have that ambient temperature, so that temperature without the wind, uh, and then you have um, a magnifying uh, factor. So when you have that wind, and you can kind of try to walk you through this chart a little bit, if you haven't looked at one of these, it's pretty fascinating. Um, so if it's calm, and then you have, um, let's say it's calm and it's 20 degrees out, and then you have a 10 mile an hour wind, it's really going to be closer to three degrees, uh, if I read that right. Um, so it just brings that temperature down. And like I said, it's going to feel colder and it's also going to be robbing you of your body heat much faster. Um, and then just kind of going back to Mount Washington, just to point out um, really what you're looking at is the highs and lows of Mount Washington. Um, and it, it's just really interesting that you can have still really cold temperatures even in July. And Mount Washington typically gets at least one day of snow every single day of the year. So a lot of this information is on that uh, Washington Observatory website. Uh, but just to point out, you're in the mountains, you got to be prepared any time of the year for cold weather. All right, so um, how do we lose body heat? Um, so we lose it in a number of different ways. Um, <laughs> hopefully I haven't in insulted anyone with this, uh, this comic, but I thought that was pretty funny. Um, so conduction is, uh, is, is direct contact. So conduction is one way that we lose body heat by just touching a cold surface. So for instance, if I took an ice cube, took it out of the freezer, put it in my warm hand, it's going to melt and then my hand's going to get cold. So my body is heating up that cold surface. You see that a lot when folks sit on cold rocks or sit in the snow, your body is heating up that colder surface. Um, so that's direct contact is conduction. Uh, convection is, uh, so basically wind. Uh, we just kind of talked about that. You saw that slide there, but basically convection is moving air or moving water and it moves that heat off of your body. And it, as your body tries to reheat itself, that, that medium, that uh, water or air uh, keeps drawing off the heat. So it's, it's, it's nearly impossible for your body to heat up in those kind of conditions um, because you're constantly uh, feeding that cold uh, source and it just keeps robbing you of your heat. Um, radiation uh, is infrared. And uh, so if like you are standing next to a nice warm wood stove, um, you can feel that heat coming off of it without directly touching. Uh, another way, I, I don't know if this is the best analogy, but when you're a kid or you see little kids working hard up a hill, dragging that sled and they get to the top and before they slide down, you know, take the hat off and you just see all this kind of steam coming off and you can kind of sometimes see that 
that uh, heat wave almost coming off the top of your head. Um, or maybe, yeah, so um, it's infrared heat loss. Uh, evaporation is, is just that it's uh, you're exercising, uh, you're producing sweat, it's next to your skin. And again, that's, that's our body's way of cooling down, but in a cold temperature, in a cold environment, that's not a good thing. Um, so we have different ways of getting around that, but evaporation um, is another uh, area that you lose a lot of heat. And the last is respiration. So um, cold air, you bring it into your lungs and your body has to work to heat that up. And as you breathe out, you lose a lot of moisture. And I will say, I'm not really gonna get into um, too much cold weather injuries, um, but what I will say about that is that um, dehydration, a lot of folks don't drink enough water in the wintertime. It's cold, why are you gonna drink water? Um, but you need to because dehydration is the gateway to all cold weather injuries, frost nip, frostbite, and hypothermia. So um, staying hydrated is, is really important. Um, and then how do our bodies produce heat? So we're not talking about external heat, like heat packets or, you know, fire. Um, we're talking about three ways that our body can only produce heat, uh, manufacture heat in three ways. The first way is very inefficient and your body can't do it for very long, which is shivering. Um, then there's uh, the, the fun way, I, I consider the fun ways is, is eating. Uh, so your metabolism, uh, so eating high energy foods, high quality foods. And then uh, the third way and most effective way um, is exercise. It's kind of interesting to think too, because most of the time, um, I have, I've got to worry about overheating in the winter. Um, so sometimes folks are kind of surprised by how easy it is while you're working hard snowshoeing skiing to overheat. All right, so uh, a few things that we can do to keep our body um, in homeostasis and just you know happiness and just staying warm and healthy uh, is the layering system. So that's it has to do with our, the clothes that we wear when we're out there doing outdoor activities. So the layering system, I like to say, be an onion. And you know, I'm sure everyone's cut an onion before. When you cut that, you've got layer upon layer upon layer. Uh, and that layering system allows you flexibility. So you're able to put layers on when you're cold, take layers off when you're getting too warm. It allows you to, to, um, to regulate your body uh, and then also to adapt to the weather conditions. All right. So uh, in this slide, just kind of showing the three basic systems, which is the base layer, the mid layer, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> and the, the outer layer. Sorry, starting to lose my voice here. Um, so the base layer, its job, um, that's the first line of defense. Um, and then the mid layer, so the base layer is there to kind of help keep you dry. Staying dry equals being warm. So that base layer, is your thinner layer. It's gonna help move moisture away from your skin to help with that evaporation uh, cooling effect and keep you dry. Uh, the mid layer is where you have um, various layers. Uh, you can have two, three, what have you, uh, depending on the type of activity you're doing. But this, is, this layer is intent, uh, its intent is to uh, retain your body heat to help keep you warm. And then the outer shell or your outer layer it's kind of like your armor against the elements. Um, so those layers help protect you from the wind and then wet environments like rain, uh, freezing uh, rain, snow, things like that. Um, so the base layer, it's your thinnest layer. Um, some of the best materials um, are um, synthetics and good quality merino wool. Uh, so again, this layer keeps you dry by uh, absorbing uh, a lot of that moisture, and moving it away from your skin. Second layer, um, when I started taking some of these photos, I suddenly realized like how dirty some of my outdoor clothing is. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully my mom is not watching this tonight, uh, even though I did tell her about it. But uh, so anyway, this is your base layer, uh, sorry, your uh, mid layer, your insulating layer. And this is the one where you really need a lot of versatility. Um, so, you can kind of see, maybe not the best picture, but really what you're looking at is uh, this fleet, uh, sorry, this um, vest, and then uh, you might have like a thinner fleece, 
I really like ones with hoods because um, that, again, can help retain a lot of body heat. And then you have uh, thicker fleece jackets or synthetic jackets or down, um, depending. The great thing about the, the puffy jackets is that they're real lightweight and compressible. Um, the, the, I guess pun intended, the downside about down is that if it gets wet, it no longer retains, it, uh, retains body heat. It uh, loses its loft. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on um, with the way they manufacture and the, the way they treat it. So there's a, a lot of cool stuff that they're doing with that material. Um, but um, if it gets wet, it's no longer all that great. Good quality synthetics um, and good wool, uh, even when they're wet, they're going to retain a lot of their insulating capabilities. Um, that's why it's real important not to wear cotton um, when you're in a cold, wet environment. Uh, the reason why cotton is uh, maybe it's the fabric of our life uh, in nice warm weather, but and it's very comfortable. But the downside is once that gets wet, the cotton no longer breathes and it retains all that moisture. It's very hard to dry uh, and it, uh, it doesn't retain any uh, insulating properties. So it's wet. It stays wet. It stays next to your skin and it doesn't keep you warm. So cotton is not a good good uh, good material for for wintertime activities and then uh, your outer layer again kind of going uh, from left to right uh, you know you can start off with just um, a uh, like a nylon jacket they're inexpensive they weigh almost nothing they pack down to almost nothing um, the green jacket there is a soft shell jacket which is really nice because it's flexible it stretches with you I love using it for backcountry skiing because um, it moves with you. Um, it's not completely waterproof though, uh, but it does breathe pretty well. And then, you know, if you're going to be going above tree line, oh, there's a little cat there. Cool. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then, you know, like things like your Gore-Tex jacket, your waterproof jacket, um, there's a lot of stuff out on the, the market that is Gore-Tex like it's their own, you know, proprietary um, material. But what you want is something that is going to protect you from wind and, and wet environments uh, and still allow moisture from your body to escape the material. Um, so that's that. Uh, I'm going to keep rolling on unless anyone's got a question. But again, please, please, uh, please add if you have anything or ask questions as we go. Um, and then, of course, it's really important. Uh, to keep your head um, and neck warm. So we lose a lot of our heat through our neck and through our head. Um, and so, you know, scarves, uh, hats, uh, balaclavas, not baklava. Uh, when I was a kid, I made that mistake. I was kind of getting into winter hiking and I went to a gear store and I said I needed one of those baklava, bak baklava uh, things. And the, the guy said I needed to go um, to a, a, a Greek pastry shop. I had no idea what he's talking about. Um, so don't try to wear baklava on your head, um, balaclava. So uh, face masks, um, buffs, uh, so all that can be used uh, to keep you warm. And then I just want to throw a shout out to all the merino wool uh, sheep out there. Thank you for making some of the finest natural outdoor fabrics. Um, wool is just a, a incredible uh, fabric. It's very durable. Um, and there's a lot of great uh, companies out there that make some really great stuff. Um, but Marina wool is kind of like the, the gold standard. Uh, there's some great ones that are mixed with synthetics. So there's a lot of great synthetic uh, fabrics out there. Um, but, uh, you know, you got to go with uh, some of the natural fi fabrics. Uh, Marina wool is, is a great one. And they're pretty cute too. All right, uh, winter footwear. So what is appropriate? <clears throat> so uh, flip-flops probably out, um, you know, your bogs and welly boots, uh, you know, that's fun for stomping around in the backyard or something, but probably not the best for, for winter hiking. Um, and again, it all kind of goes down to what you want to do, what kind of environment, but what you're looking for in a good winter boot Something, you know, if you're going to be hiking um, or snowshoeing any distance, you know, the good old bean boots, they're still my favorite for all around. But uh, if I'm going out for more than an hour or two, 
probably going to try something else. Um, so insulated versus non insulated. Um, there's some great hiking boots out there that have very little um, insulation in it, um, but uh, just enough for for uh, for hiking or uh, snowshoeing or running. Um, and then uh, one thing you don't want unless you're mountaineering is something with too much insulation in it. So you're like Sorrells or something like that it might be a bit too much insulation. Um, it may not give you enough support. So, um, you know, if you're looking at the slide, you see those dark black boots, those are mountaineering boots. They, they're very stiff. They're meant to be worn with crampons. Um, the insulation can come out. Um, they're very stiff and they're very heavy. Um, the North Face, the, the gray and yellow boot there, um, great for just, you know, winter hiking, snowshoeing. Um, some folks ask about, uh, you know, using their, their, you know, year round, their, their summer and spring, fall hiking boots. And that can work. Um, the one thing you want to consider though, is that you're going to need thicker socks. So just make sure that you try them out, go for a walk uh, around town or something in cold weather before you go on a hike with them, just to make sure your feet have enough room to accommodate those, uh, those <clears throat> pardon me, those thicker socks. Um, there are footbeds that you can get. So uh, you can get footbeds that have uh, like aluminum or other materials in it that will reflect your, your body heat. Um, so you help keep your feet warmer. Uh, and then socks, again, yes, good quality synthetics, uh, you know, good wool or blend, uh, and they come in different thicknesses. So uh, the socks that you typically use in the, the summer or spring, probably not warm enough, um, but try them on. Um, and again, I would always suggest, um, you know, you have even a layering system for your hands and your feet and your head that you can take on, uh, put on, take off as needed. And those goes for socks too. Um, you can start with a medium weight and then have a thicker, extra heavier ones in your backpack uh, that you can put on if needed. An extra pair of socks um, are great. It's, uh, you can use it for a lot of different things. Uh, put them on for, uh, <coughs> pardon me, uh, for mittens if you need to. Um, you can insulate one of your water bottles to keep that water from freezing, keep that, um, that, uh, that liquid warm. Uh, but it's always a good thing to have an extra pair of socks in your backpack. All right, so gators, not gators. Um, and the, uh, the difference there is one might bite your leg off, the other one uh, is there to help protect your leg. So uh, these are, if you haven't used them before, they're great. You can use them year round. I love them in the mud time. And uh, you know, if I'm bushwhacking things like that, they're awesome. In the winter time, they're great because they help keep um, your legs warmer and they just help keep them drier and keep the snow out of, out of your pants and boots. So uh, traction devices. Um, so we've got uh, snowshoes, obviously great. Um, and they just give you this incredible access to areas that you wouldn't be able to get to typically in skis. Uh, so you can really get off trail. Um, micro spikes, um, if you haven't used them, they're lightweight, they're small little um, spikes on them. And you can see them, those are the black ones and the black and yellow ones are crampons. So you can see, uh, hopefully you can see in this picture, a huge difference in the, the actual um, spikes on those. Crampons uh, certainly have their use, especially above tree line, but there's something you probably want to practice a lot with um, and get some training with because uh, it's, it's easier to trip on those um, and a fall with those can, can certainly hurt your leg. Um, whereas micro spikes, real easy to use, um, not too expensive. All right, <clears throat> pardon me. Sorry about that. Um, so a few uh, additional items, um, so backpacks, um, definitely suggest uh, if you haven't, you know, if you get one, have it fitted to you, make sure that it fits comfortably. And you always wanna make sure that that weight in that backpack um, is above your hips, putting most of that weight on your hips um, and the heaviest items above your hips, below your shoulder and along your spine. Um, and that will help keep that pack uh, well balanced. Uh, a few safety items that I would strongly suggest, you know, definitely a med kit. Um, I, you know, just personally, I, I would never uh, put anything in that med kit that you don't know how to use, but 
Um, you definitely medkit is important. Uh, depending how far you're going and where you're going, you might want to consider uh, things like a radio, GPS, um, like a spot GPS, cell phone, uh, and definitely a cell phone charger, uh, battery. Just keep in mind, any of those electronics are phenomenal, uh, but they do have their limitations. Um, most electron, a lot of electronics, um, I should say most, but a lot, uh, about negative 10, they start having difficulties, negative 20, they're not going to work. So um, just keep that in mind. You can do things like have, um, like put them in an interior pocket close to your chest. So it just keeps that, that warm. Um, and a few other things, uh, map, compass. Uh, I like to make sure that folks have um, either a paper copy or they take a photo of the map in the trail description. Um, but definitely a, a copy of the trail description is really helpful and, and important too. And then a whistle. Um, on that picture, you'll see an orange whistle with uh, stop. So that means stop moving, um, think, observe, and plan, possibly proceed. So the most important thing, if you get lost, is to stop. Think about what you're doing, calm yourself down, and don't try to convince yourself that you know where you are and keep going forward. Um, so um, <clears throat> the best thing to do if you, you realize that you're off trail and you don't know where the trail is, the great thing about the winter, <laughs> one of the nice things about the winter time is you can follow your, your tracks back and follow them back to the point that you know you're back on the trail, whether it's a trail marker or Karen or so forth. Uh, I, I, speaking with conservation officers with Fish and Game um, and first responders, they always say that uh, folks convince themselves and then they panic and they just keep going forward trying to convince themselves that they're going to find the trail just up ahead. And that's when people really get into trouble. So stop, think, observe, plan. Um, and then the, the, other the other picture of some, some other things that you might want to consider is, you know, you have all this great gear, but you want to take care of it um, and, and get the best out of it. Uh, I've had a lot of great luck with Nick Wax, um, the tech wash and waterproofing agents. Uh, my wife probably says I should use that tech wash and wash the clothes more often. But, um, you know, so all these things can go a long way to waterproof your boots, waterproof your clothes. Um, and just keep them in, in good condition um, and uh, help keep you, you know, drier and happier out there. All right, safety equipment uh, besides uh, the cell phones and radios and, and maps, uh, there's a few little things that I always keep in a little um, kit and they just sit, they live in, in the backpack all winter. Hopefully I never have to use them, but they're there. Um, things like uh, the orange bag up there that says SOL, uh, that is a bivy sack, so it's, um, it's a reflective material. Worst case scenario, you can get into it or put someone into it and it'll help retain that body heat. Um, high visibility uh, P-cord, which is that paracord, super lightweight, very strong for its size. Um, maybe a micro tiny little repair kit if, if you're out for a snowshoe hike or ski. Um, you might want a few things that you can just MacGyver things um, to get you back uh, if something breaks. Um, a, a headlamp. Uh, with fresh batteries and I always have extra batteries for the headlamp tape them together so that they won't roll around I can find them easily um, a knife um, doesn't have to be anything fancy but um, a few, uh, something I didn't put in that picture though is uh, like a water purification tablet uh, so filters are great however um, if they if you use them and then they get frozen then that filter or cartridge is not safe anymore uh, especially if they get dropped. So um, the filters are great. Just be aware if you use them in the winter time, you got to be careful with them. Uh, something that is really lightweight, really cheap are like iodine tablets or um, various types of uh, water purification tablets. They're inexpensive. They can live in your pack for five years or so uh, without going bad. Um, they just kind of downsize. They take 30, 40 minutes or so to activate and actually work. So um, <clears throat> So a few, a few things to consider um, to have with you. Um, hot hands, uh, those chemical packets, a glow stick, uh, things like that. Um, you know, everyone's different. Everyone wants to carry different things, but these are some of the things I would definitely suggest you have with you if you're going out for a few hours or more. 
Um, and then just trip preparation. Oh, yep, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Can you go back? What were those little plastic bags with rubber bands wrapped around them? Oh, yes. Sorry. I thank you. Someone's keeping me honest and on on uh, on on point here. So uh, so those are uh, when you go food shopping uh, and you get your produce, it's just plastic bags. And the reason why I put them in there, I always have um, in a trash bag, a couple trash bags are really good things to have too. Um, so those plastic bags, um, if your hands or feet got really cold and you're having a hard time warming them up, um, you can put your hands into dry gloves or feet into uh, dry um, socks if, if possible. You can put that plastic bag over your hand and put, or foot, and put one of those heat chemical packets and then lightly put that rubber band um, on your arm to hold it in place. Um, and basically what that's doing is that plastic bag is protecting your hand while it heats back up, protecting it from wind and water um, and trapping more of that heat. So it's just a way to kind of rapidly warm your heat, yeah, rapidly warm your feet or hands, super cheap um, and it works. So, but thank you. That's, thank you for uh, <laughs> reminding me. I didn't want to forget that. Also trash bags, um, okay. be a good idea to have at least one heavy duty contractor trash bag. You could use, you know, the trash bags that you have in your house, but they just won't last that long. Um, but a heavy duty contractor bag is very durable. Um, and there's a ton of uses you could use it for pack cover, uh, you know, rain poncho if needed. Um, but also, um, if someone was injured, um, you could put someone in there to help retain body heat and protect them. So, uh, just another, another use, uh, space blankets. So that again, that SOL, that orange bag there, that's a space blanket. It's just a it's kind of a specialized one, but those really cheap, really lightweight uh, space blankets that, that a lot of folks get after a race or a marathon. That's a, I would never go anywhere without that. It, it definitely keep it in the med kit um, or somewhere in your pack. And that can be a, a huge help when someone's getting really cold or injured. Um, One more thing you didn't talk about there, Eric, and I'll put a plug in for it is um, zip, a zip tie or two. I was on a snowshoe hike just a couple of weeks ago and we got you know a mile up into the woods and somebody's snowshoe buckle broke yeah. and if one of us hadn't had a zip tie it would have been a long slow back to the car for uh for that poor guy so Absolutely. zip ties don't do anything and they come in handy for an awful lot of stuff yes absolutely um i'm glad you you brought that up and again as a guide i carry more than than that um I didn't really want to kind of get too much into that, but a repair kit, um, not to make a shameless plug, but uh, you know, going on a guided hike, there's a number of factors that you can go and not really have to consider. So, you know, you don't have to be medically certified and trained. You don't have to worry too much about like the gear and equipment, uh, the route finding, things like that. So, you know, any of the programs that I run or like, you know, Dan Newton comes out or Ethan is leading the hike. Um, we have all that safety equipment. We have all that training and so forth. But yeah, a, a repair kit, and I'm just trying to grab, uh, never mind. Um, but a repair kit is definitely nice. So like one thing with uh, uh, like a, a pipe clamp, zip ties are great. Uh, one thing I will say about like duct tape or any tape like that, I like to put it on my hiking poles or my water bottle. Um, it's just a convenient place to, to store it. But uh, in cold weather, when you peel that duct tape, it's not gonna stick very well. So, you know, put it underneath your armpit, put it inside one of your layers of jackets for a few minutes, it'll reheat that glue up. And that goes for like athletic tape, medical tape. Um, just use your body heat to warm it up a little bit, and then you can apply it to what you need. But um, yeah, wax thread or, or uh, dental floss is another good one um, for just those emergency. And you don't need anything Usually, you don't need anything too uh, too glamorous, but yeah, some zip ties, uh, some duct tape, maybe a pipe clamp or two can really kind of help you out um, in a pinch. Um, as a fun side story, and I'm I'm sorry if we're taking a little bit too much time here, Leah. Uh, so you know, start doing this if I'm running over, but or getting too boring here. But um, <clears throat> when I was in college, I worked as a 
uh, TA my last few years for, we do a 10 day backcountry ski and snowshoe trip up to the boundary waters in Canada. And the first day out, and my professor, Christian Bisson is the outdoor ed professor at, at Plymouth State. So if you run into him, you can talk to him about this story. But um, talking about repair kits, uh, you know, we had 20 freshmen, sophomores going out on this trip and we were cross country skiing, back country skiing, <clears throat> and someone took a fell and uh, the binding popped off, the screws pulled out. Um, so uh, we started looking for the repair kit and we had nothing in our repair kit that would fix it. There was nothing. And we're out the first day on a 10 day trip and there's nothing in that repair kit that would hold a ski binding on properly. The screws were just pulled out and, you know, we were trying to like, you know, really use a Phillips and put it in there, put the, the screws in there. I think we only had one screw, we lost the other screws. Um, so there's nothing that we had, we could use. So uh, my best friend and I uh, got permission from our, from our instructor who I think was a bit embarrassed, um, sent us back. We, they set up camp, uh, Big Mac and I drove two hours back to campus, grabbed uh, the equipment that we needed and came back. So uh, kind of a hard lesson, uh, you know, have the stuff you need if, if something goes bad, especially if you're out for more than a few hours. If you're out more in the back country, you definitely wanna make sure you've got stuff that you can at least, you know, get back home, so. Um, but yeah, so uh, I think I'll just kind of finish up a little bit here with just um, trip preparation, uh, which is really, um, I, I find it really fun because uh, you can do it from the comfort of your home. Um, there's no pressure, but what I would say is, uh, you know, do your homework, take your time um, and think about where you wanna go and use your resources. So uh, one of those would be a guidebook. Um, and that gives you a lot of good information that you can't really look and find on the map. So um, one of the, example of that would be like the chimney on Osceola. If you look at a map, you can see the contour lines, you can see the general progression of that slope, but you can't see on a map what's in between those contour lines. Um, so a guidebook can give you a lot of that information that you just can't get from a map. And then a map, of course, um, working with the guidebook gives you a good idea of what to expect, what's in the area, what's around you. Um, again, you know, I think it's really important to always have a paper map uh, with you um, and a paper copy, uh, maybe a photocopy of, of the trail description. Uh, at least uh, take a photo of the trail description and keep it on your phone. Uh, but the guidebook, the trail description, and the map go hand in hand. Um, also, there's a lot of great stuff uh, online. So you can look uh, for information about, uh, I think it's New England uh, trailconditions.com. Um, but there's a number of sources out there that will give you ideas and information as to what the, the current trail conditions are. Um, take that with a grain of salt, in my opinion. Uh, you know, some of it can be pretty subjective because, you know, they're vo volunteer based. Uh, it's just people, anyone could just post information on there. And what you consider an easy trail may not be an easy trail to me. So, you know, keep an idea, uh, an open mind when you look at that information, but it can be very helpful. Um, definitely, you know, checking your weather before leading up to the trip, not just the day of, um, is really important. See those trends, see that snow depth. You know, if, if we get, I would love to get like two or three feet up here in a big storm. Um, I just don't know if I want to be breaking trail for a group the next day. So, you know, be aware of, of what that's going to do to your itinerary. Um, I think that's important to have some backups. So if the trip you want to do, you get out there and your pace is way off, um, it's just not happening or the conditions are just, you know, too difficult, uh, at least you have a backup. You can do another shorter loop or a different trail. Um, so uh, there's a saying in outdoor education called P to the seventh power, which is, uh, proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Um, and that really, I think, alleviates a lot of the difficulties out there. Um, when you take the time and really kind of do your homework and 
think about it. There's a lot of resources out there. You can always call, um, you know, different, uh, um, you know, the rec department or, you know, uh, Tim Smith, uh, the Mountain Wanderer bookshop um, uh, is it, just a huge source of information. So, uh, you know, different uh, clubs and hiking programs, you know, you can always call and get information from them. So, um, so know before you go and then know while you're on the go, while you're on the go. So while you're out there, don't be so tied. It, it, my suggestion would be don't be so tied um, to your original plan. If certain aspects or certain um, conditions um, necessitate it, you know, be open to, to changing what you intended to do. So, all right, that was a long rant, uh, <laughs> but uh, a few other sources for you. These are some books that I absolutely love um, and they're in terrible condition because I just keep going through them. But um, there's both of these. The uh, Mountaineering Freedom of the Hills is a great book. Uh, it's more towards mountaineering, but the first 10 chapters is, you know, anyone could find a lot of wealth um, from that. So, um, so that's a great book. The Allen and Mike books uh, are from, uh, they're both Knowles instructors, National Outdoor Leadership School uh, instructors. Those books, I absolutely love them. They have a whole series of them. The thing I love about it is that it's a comic. Uh, it's a ton of great information, but it's basically uh, pictures of, uh, of, of things. And it's, it's really funny. So a few sources for you. Um, gosh, I think I, I forgot a bunch of stuff I was gonna say, uh, but I'll leave you with this uh, picture. Uh, Mount Adams in April. And, uh, you know, I, I hope you all uh, you know, I'll stay around if anyone had any comments or questions. Uh, it looks like Becca is nodding off there, but no, nope, oh, she's awake. <laughs> but uh, thanks for, for sticking around. I really appreciate it. And uh, hope to see you all out there on the trail um, and uh, have a really fun, safe winter, whatever you do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, course. excellent. Uh, so um, Thank you. definitely open up if there's anyone who has any comments or questions right now, it looks like the Hastings have a hand up. <laughs> I want to know what Eric's uh, trail name was when he hiked the AT. Ah, good question. So uh, my, my name is Seeker. Ooh. Um, and so before I hiked the Appalachian Trail, I, um, I spent a little bit of time working for the Appalachian Mountain Club and I, I worked at Mizpah Hut. And the summer I worked there, there are two other Eric's. So out of the three guys working at this hut, we were all named Eric. And I spelled my name E-R-I-C-K. And somehow someone came up with the idea of doing that backwards basically, which kind of seeker. Um, and it just so happened that there was a family with little kids that were up there and you know, one that summer and uh, I actually ran into them in Georgia um, one of my first days of hiking the Appalachian Trail and they remembered me, I remembered them and they knew me at Seeker. So that just, that was it. So stuck. yeah, I, I, I think a lot of folks want to make their own name because I've heard some pretty terrible stories of people getting um, some, some not so good uh, trail names that were assigned to them. So uh, mm. I think you try to make up a name pretty quick. But that was mine. Yep. So. Excellent. Well, let's just I'll make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, but I wanted to thank you very much, Eric, and also um, let folks know that we are doing with the um, rec department. Eric's doing great little um, nature note <laughs> tidbits um, because even though this topic is all about winter safety, Eric is a wealth of knowledge about the environment um, and the, our natural world. So I've really been um, enjoying that uh, piece of your your world too, Eric. So I, I look forward to more of this. And I, I have to thank you for getting me out of the office and going out. And it's like you know that 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 one one point that I know like oh I can get out and kind of look around at uh, some of the you know sometimes. You know, you run programs and things and you don't get to always stop and really look at things. And I, I find that there's so much around us that we overlook and it's just absolutely amazing. And it's right, right out our door. Um, and also I'm raising some two pretty wild little boys. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so thank you. And uh, it's, it's definitely a pleasure well, to do those videos. I have, I have a quick question. 
What is um, the winter hike training that you're doing or requiring for people who want to do winter hikes? Um, yeah. And can you tell yeah. us a little about that and how to get exempted from it or, or do we have to do it or um, how's that working? Yeah, absolutely. So you're exempted. Um, <laughs> but basically we, we, uh, 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 Brooke Wakefield and I just decided today that, um, that we were only going to keep that as like a, a mandatory thing for, um, for folks who were coming to the area. Um, and we had no knowledge of like background with them. Um, and, and really the idea was that we wanted to, because from my observations um, over the past year, is that folks would show up and not have any idea of what they're getting them, themselves into. So the whole like <laughs> online winter safety, um, and, and that was not a dig at you, Charles, at all. <laughs> at all. Um, but uh, but no, uh, it was just we just wanted folks um, to be a little bit more aware of what they're getting into. So basically, that online training is uh, it, it's what we just did, but in more depth. It's usually two plus hours um, of me rambling, uh, but it's a bit more in depth than what we just did. But uh, again, it's not a certification or anything. So um, we're very happy to, like, to, to help folks out with that. If they wanna come out on a snowshoe hike um, or, or you know, a Saturday winter hike, um, you know, just, just call and talk to me a little bit and uh, we'll just make sure that you're you know, you're ready for it and you know, um, you know, what we're going to be doing. Uh, so again, the, the whole online thing was just to try to help folks who were just getting into winter hiking uh, to be a little bit better prepared and understand what they're getting into before they sign up. Sometimes I think, you know, the photos and the description is really enticing, uh, but then folks show up with like jeans and, um, you know, not, you know, just, just clothes that are not really suitable for 20 degree weather and so forth. So um, it was just a more in-depth uh, program that we're trying okay. to, but yeah, hopefully that answers your question. But yeah, give me a call if you're interested. And, um, you know, certainly uh, we just decided to, you know, you know, for folks who are living in the area and that we can talk to and we have a relationship with, there's really no need for us to require that. Okay. So. Thank, thank you all again for joining us this evening. Um, and coming up this month, we did have a few changes in the schedule, so I don't, I did not put our regular flyer out. So, Eric, you missed the opportunity to be on a flyer. But uh, I'll, I'll see yeah. if I can maybe <laughs> retroactive it. Um, but yeah. next week, I wanted to let folks know, and I'll have it published. Um, uh, next week, Helen Rita is going to be um, sharing. Um, guided uh, sound sound bath meditation. And um, it looks pretty interesting. So um, we'll have a flyer up for that next week. Um, the following week, I will be speaking um, about my first year in Alaska. Oh, um, hey. <laughs> I'm up, it's my turn, right, Eric? <laughs> and then- um, no, I'm tuning into that. Um, <laughs> that sounds awesome. And then um, we will have um, a fellow, um, Dylan Patrick, and I don't want to um, uh, share more information than we need to, but um, he's um, part of a nonprofit um, organization uh, foundation that we are going to be partnering with, and he um, has incredible uh, viewpoint and perspective on art and um, human development. And um, so we're lo really looking forward to that as well. And I will have the rest of the series up soon. And um, Thank you all again and have a good weekend and enjoy some outside. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thanks again, Leah, for roping me into this. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for coming out. All right. See you, everyone. Sure. All right. See you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thank you.